Thank you, worship team. That was phenomenal. I think I'm going to go quick so we can worship again. There's just, I, I love worship. David understood the concept of worship that, man, if you want to enter the presence of God, just spend some time worshiping. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. It's not like it's a system or something that he set up like, okay, first you got to do this. And, you know, there's been books written about the seven steps to entering the presence of God. It's like first you, you get to the temple court and you got to offer your thanksgiving. And then after you offer your thanksgiving, then you go to the altar and you confess all your sins at the altar. Then you go to the the the, the, the water, the the, the uh, laven of water, and, and you cl- receive his cleansing. And then you go and... No, oh, you just say thank you, God, for loving me, and you're in His presence, just like that. Um, I'm excited about my message tonight. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you think you have a message, but uh, then then it just doesn't just doesn't flow. Um, you know, uh, I know in worship, um, you know, the more you you spend with God, sometimes when it's not the leading of the Holy Spirit in a certain direction, anytime you try to go that way with that. It, it's like a, a ceiling, like a wall blocking. It, it doesn't, there's not a flow. There's not a, a current of water that you can just jump on and ride down, you know, ride a wave and, and, and let the Holy Spirit go. And, that, and that's really what, what grace is, is it's, it's God's work. It's his strength. It's his power that you're jumping in and being a part of. And that's what I want in my life, that my entire life is filled with the grace of God. But there is a way that I don't experience that, and that's through my own self-effort, by me trying and struggling and striving to do what the grace of God is already doing. So, for you know, I had a message planned. It was good and everything. I thought it was going to be good, and then, you know, it just wasn't hitting. And, you know, I'm just using this as an example that we use this for every, anything in life. Um, you know, and, and then all of a sudden, you just, you just got to keep pushing through. Um, I don't even like using that because it gives like the sense that it's like a work or something. But no, you 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 basically shut yourself down in a way and and find out like like you just keep pressing, you keep praying, you keep worshiping, you keep praising until it's like you break through and you're drilling, and then the gusher comes out. Um, that's the only way I know how to explain it, and it's real. It's inside. You feel it. There's the flow. There it is. And. Um, that's why uh, I'm excited about this message because I found the flow. I found the, the black gold, uh, so to speak, drilling for oil and stuff. But um, let's look at Romans 5.17. If you brought your Bibles, um, not, uh, I forgot where it's your, we don't bring our Bibles here, do we? No, it's okay. No. On your phone, yeah, 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 I like it. It's all good. It doesn't matter. What? I, I am. Romans 5.17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Notice the only thing you are doing in this verse in order to reign in life. This word reign is the Greek word referring to you as a king, that you are reigning as a king in life. Now, if you say, Josh, I'm not reigning as a king in life, what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you except you're not doing this part of doing the receiving of God's grace and his righteousness. Now, real quick, let's just recap. What is grace? What is righteousness? These are are church words commonly used here uh, often, but sometimes we can forget the simplicity of what they mean. I'm a picture person. I love pictures in my mind. I have the old, you know, I, I, I look at the Old Testament as really like a dictionary for New Testament terms. A lot of people, they don't understand, uh, for instance, sometimes the New Testament is com- so spiritualized that there's no effect of God in the earth. In other words, God is just spirit and there's no effect in this earth whatsoever. In other words, God doesn't do miracles today. Um, you don't feel God. God's not tangible. God's not this and that. It's because everything is spiritualized. And I find the, the common uh, theme with that is because they don't see the Old Testament as being the dictionary for New Testament terms. God always describes a spiritual th- truth through practical means. So whenever Jesus revealed a spiritual truth, he would display it in action. His spiritual truths were never designed to remain hidden. Jesus said, nothing will, shall remain hidden, but will be revealed, will come out. So whatever God puts in your heart is not designed to stay invisible and in there, but rather to come forth. Jesus' prayer was, thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? Here in earth. So that prayer, guys, doesn't work in heaven. 
You don't get to heaven and say, God, your will be done in heaven because his will is done in heaven. The prayer of the saints in the church here on earth is your will be done here, here. And how does he do that? He does that through you and I. He does that through his yielded children who will trust him and jump on this wave of grace. So what is grace? Grace is a simple term, is unearned, unmerited favor. That God favors you despite you. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. God's just so good, he favors you. The way you stop God's favor is by trying to earn it, by trying to work for it. Because you're, you're robbing God of giving. For instance, the, the Greek word uh, for favor, for, for grace, picks, paints this picture that I love, that Jesus has disposed himself, which means he has permanently set himself up in a particular position towards you. And that is a picture of him leaning towards you in favor. There will never be another moment in eternity that God is not favoring you. Now, if a very wealthy man came up to me and said, I am completely favoring you, ask away. I can ask him in confidence because why? He's already disposed himself towards favoring me. He's already disposed himself towards favoring me, so I don't have to earn his favor, earn his trust or anything like that. He's already given it all to me. That's what the grace of God is. It's freely, completely freely given. Completely free. The next part, righteousness. What is righteousness? There's a lot of different definitions out there. There's a lot of, there's a right standing with God. There's a parental forgiveness. There's a judicial forgiveness. And my goodness, it's like wrap, wrap a rope around my, my neck. And, you know, it's, it's crazy all the, the different theological terms we've come up with for righteousness. It's because it, it, we can't just simply believe that uh, you're righteous. Because a lot of people struggle with the idea, well, if I'm righteous, why do I still sin? still sin because of some other stuff, but we'll get there. But righteousness basically means a simple definition of righteousness is you're in right relationship with God. You didn't put yourself there. So why why do you think you could take yourself out? That's the thing that a lot of people don't understand is, is if righteousness is come and go based on my behavior, then nothing changed from the old covenant. If my relationship with God is based on my behavior, guess what? You're living based on the old covenant. The old covenant was completely based on you. See, the problem wasn't with God ever. And see, that's the thing. With, 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 we, we shout about God's faithfulness, right? We, we believe, God, you're faithful. You're going to be faithful. But that's never been the issue. We've never struggled with God being faithful. What's always been the issue? Am I been faithful? Is he going to come through for me because have I been faithful? Where did that come from? That came from the old covenant. God said, if you completely obey all my commandments, then I'll bless you. Then I'll be a God to you. Then you'll be a chosen nation, a chosen people. So guess what Israel did? They said, all right, God, whatever you command us to do, we can do it. We will do it. Three weeks later, they broke the very first commandment with a golden calf. Doesn't work. And so what does Hebrews say? The writer of Hebrews says, look, the problem was never on God's end. The problem is always on our end. It says that God found fault with the old covenant, not because the old covenant was bad, but because you and I were bad. Because we couldn't maintain our end of the bargain. So God was unhappy. Why? Because he could not judiciously and righteously bless us. He couldn't be a dad to you because of this covenant that you were unfaithful to. So what does he do? He sends his son to live as a man and fulfill the entire law and the entire covenant and then sheds his blood so that all your sins are forgiven. Your blood is done and Jesus took your sin so that you got his righteousness, his right relationship with God. How righteous are you? The the best way to answer that is how righteous is Jesus? Because you didn't get your righteousness or some other dude's righteousness. You got his righteousness. You got God's righteousness, so guess what that builds in me? Boldness, confidence to come to the throne of God knowing I belong there. Why? Because I'm the righteousness of God. Look, I'm aware I didn't earn it. I'm aware I could never earn it. I can't deserve it. It's a free gift. Did we not just read that? The gift of righteousness. So why are we struggling? Why, Why is it then that some areas of our life we're not experiencing the grace? Why is the grace of God not there? Why is it like there's not a flow there? You know, why is it, you know, there's still a struggle in in this area and so forth? Let's look at the next verse in Galatians. Because a lot of people think that sin is what stops the grace of God. 
Now, if sin stopped the grace of God, we would have never received the grace of God to begin with. Because guess what? We were sinful. That's how I was always taught. That's a, I don't, you were probably taught the same thing. What sin is there in your life? Hidden sin that's stopping the grace of God. And so what does that do? You're sitting there scared out of your mind like, my gosh, God's going to reveal my my secret sin to this guy. I'm going to get embarrassed in front of everybody. You know, and and guess what? So now I'm thinking, my gosh, hurry up and get over it. And and next week, I am not going to church. I am not risking that. No way. You don't want to be a part of that. You don't want your, your business displayed in front of everybody. And so you don't want that, and you, but you love God. You want to be good with him. You want to be in right standing with him. You want to have a relationship with him. So what do you do? The only thing you can do, you try to live perfectly. And then guess what happens? You don't. <laughs> and because you don't live perfectly, guess what happens? You become guilty. You become condemned. And this guilt eats away at you until finally you give up. You say, God, you're not fine. I can't do this. And welcome to the world that Jesus introduced to us that this life is not something that's possible. This Christian life is not something that was meant or designed for you to be able to do apart from him. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But very few of us actually believe that. We try to do a lot on our own. And look what Galatians says. Look what Paul says. I do not nullify the grace of God. Now, whoa, this next statement is going to be huge. Because he's talking about making the grace of God of no effect. The day the grace of God becomes no effect in my life is the day I die. And look at how do you nullify the grace of God? Does he say through sin? No. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. Whoa. Righteousness by the law. What is that referring to? Your self-effort, your strength, your ability to obey. Let's simplify it, the Ten Commandments. Your ability to completely obey God perfectly. See, I find a lot of people don't quite understand what Jesus set them free from. We, we say Jesus set us free. For instance, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Um, you know, we, we, we shout and, and, and sing and we say, like, like I see it on Instagram all the time. This is a very commonly quoted Instagram verse, you know, and everyone's liking and stuff, but nobody knows what they were set free by. They think they were set free from sin. And yes, but that's not what this verse means. Say with me, because you're going to understand righteousness comes by the law. If righteousness comes by the law, grace is nullified. And I'm going to show you why grace is a struggle sometimes for us in our life. Is It's not because it's on God's end. It's because you're trying to earn it. Check check it out. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So we hear that and we say, don't give in to that sin and that yoke of bondage. Do not give in to that bondage. Jesus set you free from that bondage. Jesus set you free. Okay, yoke of bondage, that's a big deal. Do you know what a yoke is? A yoke is what they put around an ox's neck. Basically, that ox goes and is a slave to wherever that master wants him to go. So a, a, a yoke goes around the neck and can move in a giant beast. So what he's saying is there is something that put a yoke over your neck that told you what to do, and you were a slave and had to obey. What is it that put this yoke on your neck? Is it sin? No. It's not sin. How do you know, Josh? Are you just making this up? Of course not. Galatians chapter 4, in context. Now, Galatians was not written by Paul in chapter and verse. Galatians is a a letter. So you can't separate chapter 4 from chapter 5. Besides, no, it doesn't say therefore. So, Um, Galatians chapter 4. Verse, I think it's 23. It's a new Bible. Sorry, my pages are kind of stuck together. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Right before he says, you've been set free from this yoke of bondage. What does he say? Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman. Oh, there's, there's bondage right there. By the bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. 
and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants. So he's talking about covenants here. For the, the one covenant for Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. What covenant was given at Mount Sinai? The law. That's covenant number one. For this, is, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to J Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So what is Paul saying? He's saying that first covenant given at Mount Sinai, what did it do? It produced bondage. It put a yoke around their neck. But what about us? He says we've been set free from this. What is he talking about? Please continue. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. The Jerusalem above, which is free, that's what you and I are a part of. We are citizens of heaven. We sometimes forget that we're not of this earth. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Happy anniversary, by the way. Yes, 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 yes. We're talking about bondage. <laughs> Anyways, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Verse 27, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman should not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, which came from Mount Sinai, which is Hagar, which is the law, but of the free woman, which is of Jerusalem, which is above. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ sets you free. What is it that you are free from? You are free from the, the commandments and the ordinances that were against you, that were telling you what you couldn't be or do, and now, because of Jesus, you are through grace. Anytime you try to achieve what God has given you for free, you, become, you, you bring yourself under the power of the law. And any time you bring yourself under the power of the law, you put that yoke back around your neck. And you are in bondage, a slave to what? The flesh, where sin dwells. Why is it people, Christians, are still struggling with sin so dramatically? It's not because sin's the problem. It's because they still have this yoke of bondage around their neck. It's because they are still trying to prove they're a Christian. They're still trying to prove their right standing with God. They're still trying to prove this and prove that to God. God, I'm going to prove I'm faithful to you. I promise I'm going to be good this week. I'm going to be good this month. They're trying to prove what God's already said. God's not after your obedience of actions. God's after your obedience of faith. God's after the obedience of your heart. He wants your heart. He wants your trust. And through that trust, everything else is taken care of. Everything. So what about sin then? What does God say about sin? Look at the next verse in Romans chapter 4. Forsaken for the sake of all. Did it? Is it? Oh, that's okay. Forsaken for. Verse uh, 5 there. But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Even David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness without works. What does David say? Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Stop. Like I've said before, your past is not yours. Your past does not belong to you. It is illegal for you to access your past apart from the blood of Jesus. Why, Josh? When Jesus was on that cross, his inheritance was your sin. What an inheritance that he took for us. We inherited his righteousness. Your past truly does not belong to you. It is illegal to access your past, which has been covered by the blood of Jesus. You are that blessed man. No, Josh, I don't think so. I think David was writing about himself. Guess what? David's sins were imputed against him. When David sinned with the census, when David slept with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, he was punished. Thousands of people in Israel were, were died and were killed, and, and he was at war because of his sin. He did not experience this. And I believe David, in this psalm, when he's writing, he's, a, he's like a prophet, and he sees this future generation, and he's saying, oh my, blessed are those whose sins are all covered. 
past sins. And what about future? Look at verse 8. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Josh, I, this person doesn't sin. If this person doesn't sin, then what sin is there to impute? It's precisely because we still will sin that God is telling you, I'm not imputing it. What does impute mean? Charge it to your account. I'm not going to charge your mistake against you. How can a righteous God, a righteous judge do that and remain righteous? By charging his perfect son with your mistake. That sin you're going to do next week, guess what? God already saw it. God's in eternity. He's seen the end from the beginning. God saw your sin, all sin, every mistake, every wrong motive, every wrong piece of your heart, everything, and charged it all to his son Jesus at that cross. So that today he can say, guys, guess what? I'm not charging you with anything. And he goes so far to say in Hebrews chapter 10 that I will never remember your sins anymore. I will never remember your sins anymore. The fact that he will never remember them uh, uh, gives the, 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 the implication that he did remember them at one time. When was that? That was on the body of Jesus. He will not impute. A lot of people are afraid of this because they think, you know, you hear that, that you're completely forgiven, that God's actually not charging you with sin. You're free of all sin, that you're going to go run out and break the world record for sin. That you're going to go out, well, then if I'm forgiven, I'm just going to go live any way I want. I'm forgiven. You know what's worse, what I find all the time, is a lot of Christians that say, well, I'll just do this and ask for forgiveness later. I'll confess my sins and be forgiven. That's not how God works. God says you're already forgiven before you sin. You know what happens when you realize and come to the understanding that you are already forgiven before you sin? What did Jesus say about the woman? He who is forgiven much loves much. The greater you see how forgiven you are, the more you're going to fall in love with Jesus. So what's the result then of you having the revelation of your complete forgiveness of the righteousness of God and the grace of God? Look at Hebrews. Hebrews 7, For there is then an annulling of the previous commandment due to its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect, but now a better hope is introduced. What is this better hope? This better hope is Jesus. He's made you the righteousness of God. Your sins are covered. You are forgiven. God is not charging you with sin. God will never remember your sins ever again. And what is the result of hearing this? We draw near to God. God set it up so that when you hear the gospel message, you will be drawn to him. When you hear about your forgiveness and you hear about the grace of God, your heart can't help but get drawn to him because God is interested in you. God isn't interested in what you do for him as much as he's interested in you. He wants your heart. He wants your trust. He wants you because you are his kid. Look at this. When we draw near to God, what happens? Look, look at Psalm 37, verse 4. Watch this. Take delight in the, the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Now, I know we've read this before, and we think, well, if I'm desiring a car, a boat, a house, you know, God will give it to me. You know, that's, that's not what he's saying. Look at the deeper meaning here. Look at the deeper meaning. What is he saying? When you delight yourself in the Lord, a.k.a. when you draw near to God, what happens is he creates the desires in your heart. You know what a desire is? It's something you can't shake. I don't know if you've ever been addicted to something before, but you got to get your next fix. It, it, it pulls on you. It, 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 you. You have this, and you, it's this desire in the flesh that you can't stop. You want the next hit. You want the next whatever it is, if it's food or soda or drugs or alcohol, whatever it is, you, you, you're, there's this, this fleshly desire that is causing you to do things. What he's saying is when you draw near to me, I place desires in your heart which work so that these desires in your heart cause you to do things. Are you following? He says in Philippians that God gives you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God said in Hebrews 10 that he's going to write his desires on your heart so that when you draw near to God, he drops in their desires. 
Now bear with me for a second so I can share with you, God has placed certain desires in my heart that didn't come with didn't come from me. This came from drawing near to God that I have a desire and these desires are not something that we can accomplish. These are not desires that are possible for you to fulfill. These desires actually require you drawing back to the presence of God for him to meet them. So look what God does. God sets it up so that he places a desire in your heart so that you have to go back to him to meet it. He placed these desires in my heart for a church that is filled with the glory of God, the presence of God to such a degree that people for miles and miles around are affected by it. That's impossible. Praise God, it's impossible. He dropped that desire in me, not so that I could just dream about it, so so I could go to him and go to that throne and he can make it a reality. He dropped this desire in my heart that whenever someone's sick or depressed or full of fear or anxiety and comes here, they leave free. I don't know how that can happen, but I know he does, and he dropped that desire so that he could make it happen. He puts desires in your heart that are so big, they require him. They require his hand so that we can do this next thing in Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 16, let us then come with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say how often you approach the throne of grace. It says when you're in time of need. Who determines the time of need? You do. Back to Galatians, when we were seeing Galatians, I don't nullify the grace of God for if righteousness comes by the law. Guess what? If righteousness comes by the law, you don't do this. Why? Because you got it. You don't need God. You don't have any needs. I'm working this out. I'm going to perfect myself. I'm going to work this out by my flesh. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to do this. I'm going to accomplish this. I'm going to do this. And you're strong in yourself. Where's your trust? Your trust is in yourself. Your trust is not in God. I get to go to the throne of grace with confidence and boldness to receive grace and mercy in time of need. I set the time of need. See, God is after your heart. You know what's amazing is The Holy Spirit, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as your comforter, your counselor, your guide, your standby, your advocate. But he's only a counselor to those that need counseling. He's only a helper to those that need help. He's only a guide to those that need guidance. Some of us are so strong in ourselves, the last person we go to is Jesus. The last person we talk to is the Holy Spirit. The last person we depend on is the only one that can actually accomplish that thing we need. There's only one place where your entire needs can be met and satisfied, and that's at the throne of grace, at the very presence of God. So God designed it so that when you hear this message of grace and forgiveness, he drops desires in your heart. Why? Because he wants you in his presence. That's what his, his desire is, not just you running around, but you with him. That's what he did. Everything was for his family so that he could have you as his child. And Jesus described the Holy Spirit as all these different things. But you know what's the only thing? The Holy Spirit is actually crying out at all times. The Holy Spirit is all these different things. He's revealing to us the things given to Jesus from the Father. He's constantly working in us. But there is one thing the Bible describes that he is constantly crying out presently every moment of every day. What is that? Abba, Father. I think before anything, we need to have a revelation of our dad. I know so many people have not had good relationships with their father. A lot of times we look at God and interpret God as a father through our relationship with our earthly father. Maybe we've been rejected. Maybe we haven't had that father squeeze us and grab us and say how proud he is of us, how proud he is of you, how much he loves you, how much he thinks about you when you haven't done anything. You've done nothing to deserve it, but because he loves you, it's not because of what you've done or not. It's because you're his kid, you're his daughter, you're his son. That's what the Holy Spirit is telling you in your spirit right now. You're his kid. You're his kid. You're his kid. You're his kid. He's crying out, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And the more you draw near, the more you hear the cry of the Holy Spirit in your heart saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. 
Because as much as your earthly father is your father, he's not your eternal father. He's your father here on earth, but he does not represent the love of your heavenly father that gave up everything. And God is not interested in just loving you when you do good. He doesn't do that. He loves you because he is love. And he is grabbing you and squeezing you and telling you how much he loves you. Why? Because he loves you. And he set up this whole system so that you, the more you come to his presence, the more you see something in his face. You know, neurologists found that from a child born till they're two years old is they're actually building the strong foundation of joy in their, for their life. That a child, when they're born till they're two years old, they are learning what joy is. It's like they are staking the boundaries in their life of what joy is. So they look for them, which create the sparkle in their eye. In other words, my daughter looks for those that where she is the apple of their eye. She's looking at your face and seeing, am I loved? Am I, is there joy here? Is there relationship here? She's not conscious of it, but she is learning joy. She's learning who, so what does she do when she sees mommy or daddy or Grammy or, or papa or grandma or grandpa? She opens her arms and runs. Why? Because as a child, you only want to be where you're loved. What, the, the greatest cry of a child's heart is to be hugged, is to be loved. That's not, that, and that never goes away. The foundations are built as a child, and if they're not built right, you can live a dysfunctional life for the rest of your life. It's because those, that joy you didn't learn. You didn't realize how loved you were. You didn't realize you were the apple, the sparkle in someone's eye. So what does God say? Draw near to me. Seek my face. And the more you do, the more you see how much you are the very sparkle in his eye. David said, if I could count the amount of thoughts you think towards me, they'd be more than the very sand. You know, Jesus revealed the father in many ways, but I don't think there's a more powerful way than the story of the prodigal son. And I think it's a wrong title. I don't think it's about the prodigal son. I think it's about the loving father. They hear... The younger son says, hey, dad, give me your inheritance, please. He probably didn't say please. Basically, what he's saying is, I don't want to wait for you to die. I want my inheritance now. I want my money now. So he takes the money. The dad acquiesces to it, gives him the money. And what does he do? He runs off, spends it, lives a crazy lifestyle, sins. And he's, while he's gone, Jesus paints this picture of the dad He's missing his son so much that wakes up in the morning, goes out on his porch and just looks out over the horizon, waiting to see his son come back day and night, waiting to see perhaps is that him? No, it's not him. Another day gone. Next day gets up. Is that him? No. And the son's over in the pig pens, feeding the pigs, trying to eat. And he comes to the realization now, What took him so long to get to this place where he decides, you know what? My my father's servants live better than I am right now. So I'll go back and I'll tell my dad, hey, let me just be one of your hired servants. And let me work for you so I can eat. I believe he was there so long because of shame, because of guilt. He was there because he was ashamed of what he had done with his father's money. How he had treated his, his dad. He's guilty. He, he feels down. He's like, you trusted me with this. You gave this to me, and look what I did with it. You don't want to go face that person face to face. You don't want to look at someone in the, in the face and see utter disappointment. You'll avoid that at all costs. So, so many people are avoiding God. They think God's face is a face of disappointment, that he's, when you come to his presence, he's pointing out your flaws, your imperfections, the areas you need to improve and grow. Show me that in the scripture. The law did that. God doesn't do that. God is saying that you're the apple of his eye. And so the the kid says, I'm going to go back. So he comes back, and what happens is he's a far distance off. He's 
he's reciting his, his speech to his dad. He says, I'm going to tell him that, you know, I, I, uh, I'm no longer, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he's reciting this over and over and over again and bracing himself for the moment of shame and guilt and disappointment that he's about to receive from his dad. And he comes close, and there the dad wakes up that morning, goes out as his normal routine to look across the horizon to see when his son's coming back, and he sees a glimmer of someone in the distance. And what does this father do? The most undignified thing a man in that culture could do. He picked up his robes. He picked up his clothes because they were long robes back then, and you didn't run. You walked everywhere. It was undignified to dance. It was undignified to run. And that father could care less about all the people and all of his neighbors talking about his mushy, gushy love and how he, he's obsessed with his son. He didn't care about what anybody thought. All he cared about was loving his son picked up his clothes, and he sprinted, the Bible says, words of Jesus, sprinted towards the sun. It's funny. It wasn't us running to God. It was him running to us. We got it backwards. We didn't find God. He found us. The only reason you're here today is because of the drawing of the Holy Spirit in your heart. God, by his grace, has moved upon you and dropped something in you and placed a desire so that you would come seek him. Why? So you could come to Abba, so you could come to Daddy and see how much you're loved. And the father ran, and as the son, I'm sure, saw him getting closer and closer, getting more worried, more concerned about what this is going to look like, what's going to happen when he gets here, and what does the father do? He jumps on his neck and squeezes him, embraces him, and begins to kiss him and kiss him, and love on him. And the son says, Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father interrupts before he goes any further. And what does the father do? Bring the robe. Put the robes on him. What is that? Righteousness. Relationship has been restored, not because the son did anything, but because the father is good. The father loves the son. The father doesn't want the son to think that there's anything in between their relationship. I want you to know how much you mean to me and how loved you are by me. I'm giving you this robe. I'm not thinking about what you did with that inheritance. I'm not, that's not even on my mind. You right now are on my mind. And then what? The ring, a picture of authority, a picture of peace restored, the very presence of the family, the family name restored, that not only are you in a right relationship with the father, you've been restored to the family. And the sandals on his feet, and then the very next thing, the killing of the fatted calf and the party. So many times I get asked the question, and it's a good, valid question. After we get saved, then what? After I'm saved, then what? You know, we, we've, we've been this way most of the time. Most, of, most Christians, unfortunately, we, we, this is just because it's, it's, it's carnal. It, it's natural that we want to earn and prove ourselves. We want to work for things. So we get saved and we say, Jesus, thank you so much for saving us. And then you hear about what a Christian should be like. So what do you do is you run over to the rules and regulations over here to Moses to try to prove what happened here. A work of grace, you're trying to prove it through your efforts. And as you try to prove it with Moses in the law, you fall and you fall on your guilt and shame and you're drawn away from God. Do you realize under the law, they could not even touch the mountain that God was on? They couldn't even touch the mountain he was on. You and I today sit in his lap. We get to sit in our daddy's lap and talk to him and enjoy his presence because he's enjoying your presence more than you're enjoying his. And eventually we go through this cycle of falling and going back to Jesus. Oh, I feel great. And then I go back to prove what happened and then I fall and come back. You're missing the whole point of what's next. It's the embrace with the Father, and then you walk over into the party. You walk and you live in this embrace. You carry it. You never leave his arms. So many of us, we, we leave the Father's love. We leave the consciousness of how much he loves us. We leave his embrace, and we try to go do life without his embrace. Jude said it this way, keep yourselves in the love of God. John said it this way, if you see anybody that loves the world, 
Why? Why is it that someone would love the world? He says simply it's because the love of the Father is not in him. When we don't have his love, we're not in his embrace, we seek for it some other way. We seek for that satisfaction, that feeling of acceptance. See, many of us believe that we're accepted before God, but we don't believe that we actually bring him joy. We know we're accepted, yeah, because he has to on a technicality. Jesus was the good guy and saved us, and, but God's still angry. No. First, Paul said, what is the kingdom of God? And close with this. What is the kingdom of God? What is the summation of the kingdom of God, this kingdom we live in? He said, the kingdom of God is not in food and drink, not what you eat or don't eat, not what you drink or don't drink, but it is righteousness, right relationship, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is because of our right relationship with God, our Father, and because of the peace, the very atmosphere of heaven that floods our life. It results in joy. It results in celebration. It results in rejoicing. We got to live in the rejoicing. We got to live in the party. There's nothing really to be ashamed of. Jesus carried our shame. He carried our guilt. We can rejoice in the presence of our Father because of how much he loves us. Let's stand and let's take communion together. I still find it amazing when I read and Paul was preaching in a message and he was preaching so long that one of the people fell asleep <laughs> and, uh, and when the guy fell asleep, it was kind of unfortunate because he was sitting in a window. He didn't want to fall asleep while sitting in a window and he fell three stories and died. Paul's feeling pretty guilty right now that he preached so long. No, but Paul ran downstairs looked at the guy and said, no, he's not going to die. His life is in him and raised him from the dead. That wasn't enough of a miracle and a work of God in that moment to, to finish the meeting, right? I mean, if someone got raised from the dead right now, I think we could all go home pretty excited. Yet, it was so important for him to do this that they went back upstairs and broke bread together. Communion was the focal point of their life. Why? Because it represents Jesus. It's always pointing us, realigning us to Jesus. The only reason we stand before God today in right relationship with peace with God and live in this joy is because of Jesus, because of his broken body and because of his blood which was shed. Your sins are all covered by his blood. Your, you have been cleansed of all unrighteousness by his blood. Let's get ready to worship and during... Worship, feel free to take communion.